There are people throughout the world that have interesting stories to tell. Stories of heroism, acts of kindness, near-death experiences, successes, and failures. You usually hear of these stories from people that live in another state or country. But what about the stories from within your own community? Everyone has a story to tell. And by everyone, we mean your neighbor, your coworker, the person behind you at church, people you interact with on a daily basis, or maybe even you. Welcome to the DTV Podcast presented by the Bless Your Heart Nonprofit Corporation. I'm Brendan Mathern, and I'll be your host as we speak to some of the most interesting people up and down Bayou Lafourche. Today we're exploring the history of one of the biggest economic engines in Lafourche Parish, Port Fouchon. Joining us today is Executive Director of the Port, Chet Chasson. Chet, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Brendan. So like we start every show here, Chet, uh, before we jump into the history of the port, we'd like to know a little bit about you. So tell us who's your mom and dad. Uh, tell us about your family and, uh, and, and where you grew up and, and how you came to be in the position you're in now. All right. So I grew up in La Rose. Um, uh, my parents are Chris and Deborah Chasson. They both grew up down in Galliano and Golden Meadow. And uh, growing up in La Rose with my brother, Darby Sh- Dr. Darby Chasson. I have to say that. <laughs> he would fuss me, but I'd say Dr. <laughs> Darby Chasson. He's the eye doctor down in Cutoff. Uh, but, but really proud to be from down the bayou and uh, all my life. Uh, fortunate enough to go to uh, public school here in, in Lafouche Parish in South Lafouche and graduated from South Lafouche in 1994 and um, went up to Baton Rouge and went to LSU I have an undergraduate degree in political science, which there's not much you do with that. So what I decided to do is get a master's degree. And I have a master's degree in public administration. Um, And so I graduated with my undergrad in December of 98. So I say I did five football seasons in the LSU Tiger Band, Go Tigers. Um, And I love every minute of it. Uh, And... I got my master's degree in December of 2001, again in public administration, and was fortunate enough to be able to move back home. And um, so I moved back down. I, I get, you know, got married to a, uh, my wife, Lana, who's not from down the bayou. She's from, uh, I call her a river rat. She calls me a bayou rat. She's from Brule, Louisiana, up across the river from Baton Rouge. And uh was able to convince her to move down the bayou, and uh, she loves it, and she's a teacher down here at South Lafouche, actually. Uh, she's starting her second year at South Lafouche. She's been teaching for uh, many years, almost 20 years now. Um, but we enjoy raising our kids. I have two two children. Uh, enjoy raising our kids down here. Um, my son is starting his senior year tomorrow or this year at uh, – at South Lafouche, and my daughter is a, going to be a sophomore at Nichols. Uh, so very proud of, of them and proud to raise them in South Lafouche down the bayou. Uh, but in terms of, of my career, um, when I moved down here in January of 2002, or back down, should I say, um, I, I just needed a job. So I went to work for Edison Shues Offshore in their IT department uh, working on, on their computers. Um, and then like five months in, um, I saw a position on the paper, uh, a logistics coordinator for an offshore, um, utility boat company called Gulf Tran Incorporated and, um, was able to, to get that job, uh, as a logistics, uh, manager. And then about six, eight months in, I became the personnel manager for that boat company. Um, you just kind of managing 300 or so, um, employees, uh, that worked on boats, uh, as a very young <laughs> 27 year old, you know, right. uh, which was, was interesting. And I learned a lot. Um, and you know, when I was in college in, uh, at LSU, I would come home for the summers and work for the port commission, uh, as a, a on the mosquito crew. Uh, so I worked, uh, with them cutting grass, picking up trash with the maintenance department and just really kind of started to see what the port was and kind of learning it just by being around it for three, 
summers um, and, and always thought that if, if I ever came back um, and moved back down here from college that um, I would probably want to end up there in some sort of capacity. So I started applying for jobs that would come open there, ones that I didn't, you know, qualify for, but I, I had my name out there. And, and then uh, one finally came up, uh, and it was for uh, to be the director of economic development. And I applied for that job. I got an interview. Uh, didn't get it, um, but continued to pursue and continued to talk to uh, my predecessor, Ted Falgu, and the folks that worked there. And ultimately, uh, just a few weeks later, quite honestly, um, I got a call back saying, hey, um, the person we hired for that position is going to a different job. That happened to be Henri Boulay. If you, you know, everybody knows Henri Boulay. Uh, he left from the port to go run the LA1 coalition, and now... Right. Uh, we'll probably talk about that in a little a little bit uh, later in the podcast, but um, so I, I ended up rolling into a position, um, and when I started with the port in on September twelfth of two thousand five was my first day working for the port commission. Um, I was the economic development and grants administrator, so that was a couple weeks after Hurricane Katrina, uh, and really just dove into learning everything I possibly could and soaking it in. Um, and was able to be successful with dealing with FEMA and all of the projects that came around uh, from Hurricane Katrina. And again, just kept learning as much as I possibly could. And, you know, uh, doing that when um, Ted Falgu uh, decided he was ready to retire, um, I went to uh, the at that point was the director of operations, uh, Davey Bro, who had been there for, at that time, about 15 or so years, and said, hey, you know, I'm not going to jump in front of you. Do you are you going to go off the position? And he said, no. He said, I, I can see where you're going, and you like politics, and you, you understand how the government works, and, and that whole realm. He said, I like doing what I'm doing. How about you? You know, if you want it, go get it. And um, I put my name in, and the board was happy with what I was doing before with in business development and grant writing. Um, I had become a director by then of, of, of economic development, and um, they decided to, to hire me. And, and look, I really feel very fortunate to be in the position I am today. Even, um, you know, I've been with the port for 16 years um, and 11 years, 11 and a half years as, as port director, and thank God every day for – uh, the position that that I've been able to um, to be a part of and working for the community that I grew up in is just a wonderful thing to go to work every day. And it's um, the you know our board of commissioners are excellent people. Um, our community is a wonderful community. The people we deal with every day are really great. Our employees, the staff of the port commission, are there for the right reasons. Um, so it's really a, a, a wonderful thing to go to work every day. And I, I, I'm very lucky, and, I, and, and um, um, my family keeps me humble, um, you know, that the, which families tend to do. But I'm, I'm you know, really appreciative of that uh, because um, I, I'm, I'm thankful for the, what I'm able to do every day. Well, with that said, uh, you, as, as you mentioned, uh, your predecessor being Ted Falgu, um, and and obviously, while Ted was there, I, I mean, the port gained uh, in, in a lot, uh, not only business, but just in popularity. Uh, you know, he, Ted obviously did a lot of great things for the port while he was there. But Ted leaving uh, and, and being such a big name, you coming in, you're a much younger. And uh, what was that? Was there an intimidation factor? Uh, was there some nervousness coming in uh, at such a young age to replace someone uh, who obviously was a legend around that office and had done so much? I, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, can't sugarcoat that. I was uh, at 33 years old. I was the youngest port director in the country, um, which in and of itself is <laughs> it's pretty right. daunting to think about. <laughs> Um, but, but really was, was happy to, to take on the challenge and you, I can tell you this, the people that you have that you work with every day, if, if I don't have those experienced people working with me, I can't say they work for me because we all work together. If I don't have them working with me, 
I'm not successful. Um, and, and I think that's what I was grateful for, for the, for the knowledge that they all had. And I, I had just to, to pull that from, and I was able to pull a lot of knowledge from, from Ted Falgu and, and the, the type of board that we have of the port commissioners who are the only elected port commission in the state of Louisiana for port commission sake, um, are very knowledgeable people in the community as well. So, um, you know, they legislate. We execute what they want us to do uh, for the betterment of the community, and it's, I think I think at the end of the day, it's just understanding what our job is, and it's it's business development, it's it's bringing in jobs and investment into our community, and if we we continue to keep that in mind, we, we're going to win. Um, and so it's it was certainly a daunting task to take on, especially uh, you know January 2010 was my first, you know, January 1st was my first day as port director. And I thought I had an idea of what the job was until April 20th of 2010. And we all know what that's about. And that's the, the, the Macondo incident and the terrible tragedy that occurred there with loss of life. And, and as well as the, the environmental issues that we dealt with, 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 um, and, you know, I, I, I can tell you that, um, the job has changed a lot from what I thought it was going to be. Um, and, and from, from that experience, um, it, it was difficult. It was hard. You and I, Brennan <laughs> spent a lot of time down in Fushan, many hours, late nights, um, dealing with those issues, uh, uh, that, 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 that incident caused, but from, from a professional standpoint and from a learning experience standpoint, it was probably, the best, I guess, trial by fire that, that a new port director could have. Um, I learned so much in a short period of time that has kind of led me down to be what I think is this, the port kind of leading um, in a lot of different areas when it comes to the industry that we serve, our industries, um, coastal restoration advocacy, and those sorts of things. I can definitely relate with the oil spill being a, a trial by fire for, for my career as well. And I definitely want to focus on uh, on where the port's headed, and, and we'll get there in a little bit. But let's rewind the clock to before you were ever there. Let's talk about the history of the port, and let's go all the way back to the beginning and how it started. And, and the, the beginning of the port is such a great story. It's it's bananas. It's literally, literally. bananas. Uh, so yeah, tell us how funny. it all got started. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate you saying that, and we'll, we'll get to the to the bananas part that you're talking about. But uh, so um, Senator Aero Rapalay, uh, we have Aero Rapalay Road down in the port. Uh, we have a, a, a bronze bust of him. His name's come up a time or two I'm, on the podcast. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Uncle Rap. Uh, so uh, there's a bust of him in our in our lobby. Um, Basically, Port Fouchon is his brainchild. Uh, he thought about when he, he went down to the port and he saw, <laughs> as we like to say, muskrats and mosquitoes and said, we need to build a port here. And um, as being a senator, he brought it up to, you know, worked with the community, uh, got people to support it and brought it, uh, created some legislation and brought it to the state capitol. And... Basically, the Greater Lafourche Port Commission was created in 1960, signed into law by Governor Jimmy Davis, Mr. You Are My Sunshine himself. Um, we have a picture that we show in every presentation that we give um, that has that original picture with uh, Governor Jimmy Davis sitting at his desk in the governor's uh, office in the Capitol, signing us into law with Senator Ayo Rapalay standing up right behind him and two of our original uh uh, port commissioners, and uh, Mr. Roland Falgu and uh, Mr. Dudley Bernard are, uh, are are in that picture. And we, you know, every time we do a presentation, we t- we you have to bring the history. You know, we, um, in 1960 we were created. That's that's our history. That's where we started. Uh, so we we were started as you know just a small port. There were you know there were trawlers and, and fishermen that were utilizing Port Fouchon. Uh, and and over the 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 initial port commission was an appointed port commission, just like every other port commission in the state of Louisiana is. However, um, that was changed 
of just uh, about five years into uh, the port commission being created to uh, being a an elected board of commissioners and we've been elected ever since um, to six year non staggered terms uh, for the for those port commissioners um, and just for, for for the listening audience our jurisdiction is the tenth ward of Lafouche Parish so basically the intercoastal canal south of the Gulf of Mexico so that's what we oversee so. Uh, if you ever see a harbor policeman up in uh, looking up the bayou in, in, uh, inside the 10th Ward, it's because we're not just Port Fouchon, we're not just the South Lafouche Airport. We're the entire 10th Ward of, of Lafouche Parish um, looking at after navigation and um, economic development there. So anyway, it, you know the, the port was pretty slow to, to, to take um, take action. Um, there wasn't a lot of funding, so you had to kind of piece things together. Um, but really, there were there were two dock facilities that were built early on um, in the late '60s, early '70s. One is still there, and it was the, um, well, it may have been a, something different, but it's basically at the corner of um, where Bayou Lafouche, Bell Pass, and Old Pass Fouchon intersect. So that right at that corner. Um, the Nerby Collins Marina was kind of built just a few years later, but then also was the banana dock. Okay. So that was what you're, what you alluded to is that it's all about bananas. So really one of the, one of the, the biggest things about the port was Senator A.O. Rapale being at the state Capitol for all these sessions and hearing about what's going on around the state, heard that the banana trade was leaving the port of New Orleans. And he said, man. We need to take. We need to get the banana trade here, so we can we can have some sort of activity here in the port. So, we built, or he, they built, what we affectionately still call the banana dock. Right now, it's it's a Martin Fuel dock facility, Martin Energy Services. Uh, it's probably one of the tallest in in elevation docks in the port. It's made out of concrete, um, and is the only dock facility in Port Fouchon that has rail associated with it now if we if we understand there is no railroad going down to the port and i get asked that question often like why is there no rail i said well in 2006 when i was kind of early, young into my my port career uh, i was asked i was tasked with trying to figure out what the cost would be kind of get some estimates call around it would cost about two billion dollars to bring a rail wow. down to fushaw <laughs> That's not going to happen, right? right? Okay, so uh, going back to the banana dock, uh, so that, that dock was built with some grant funds. And Senator A.O. Rapoli got those grant funds to, um, they, there had to be a rail component, okay? So he took those funds that was really deemed for rail and used them to build a dock facility and did put rail on them. It just doesn't connect to anything, okay? <laughs> so he's probably one of the reasons why we have strings attached to grants these days, right? <laughs> but but I think it's a it's a really interesting story because down the bayou, those are the kind of things that we have we have to think creatively every day uh, in order to achieve the things we want to, and that was the way he did. And there's you know a number of other stories about how. You know, there was a lot of uh, excavation that took place down there for sand and stuff, and that was kind of really where the port got its got got started was kind of some excavation of sand to utilize in construction and that sort of thing. But ultimately, we never had one banana offloaded at the banana dock. Uh, but it it was coming around the time where the oil and gas industry uh, close close by, you know, uh, in the marshes and just offshore in Bay Marchand started to really kick off. And that's where the port started to flourish. And through the years, um, you know, we have a picture that we show to folks that, you know, in, we were created in 1960 and it shows 1978. And between those first 18 years, you had basically two or three docks built in the port. And then we show a picture from 78 to 2019 or now. And I mean, it just looks like this, uh, just massive expansion, and it was. 
And and what's happened over the years is, you know, fast forward from 78 to the mid 80s, we had the oil bust, right? Everybody talks about the mid 80s just being this downturn in the industry. But quite honestly, more often than not, what happened was uh, companies started to choose Fushell as their shore base. So we kind of, the port itself kind of grew a little bit in that bust because what was happening was instead of having a dock facility at every little port along the coast, they were saying, let's consolidate and have one place. And because of the port's location, centrally in the Gulf of Mexico, immediately on the Gulf, only 30 minutes from the sea buoy to its first dock, it became just like the old real estate adage, location, location, location. It became the spot that was located right in the middle of the Gulf that were, was easily accessible and started to build the amount of commodities necessary and the expertise and the, the, the tenant base, you know, the, the dock facility base that could service this industry in the most efficient way possible. You know, for for our listeners out there who know what Port Pouchon is or, or maybe not as familiar, but but just don't know a lot of details about it. I know we have a lot of listeners that have probably worked in Fouchon, maybe most of their career, and it's just not a big deal to them. It's just where they go to work. But as someone who doesn't work there, and and uh, as many of our listeners are, it's it's so amazing to go there and, and to see the facilities, uh, massive equipment, uh, cranes, and, and mm-hmm. things like that. It's just something you don't see every day, no matter right. where you live, other than the port. Uh, but you, you kind of hit on something that I wanted to bring up next is – with, with the ebb and flow of the oil and gas industry uh, going back from the 80s now to today, uh, when, when you saw the what they call the bust in the 80s until now, things have changed somewhat. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how uh, Port Fouchon is affected by the ups and downs of the oil right. and gas industry? So, yeah. So we, uh, I'll, I'll kind of go back a little bit to, to get to where what you're asking about. So, the 80s, we, we kind of grew a little bit. Yes, it was a downturn, but we, we kind of started to, to accumulate more businesses. And then we kind of kind of struggled through and, and got to the mid-90s. And in 1995, Congress passed the Deepwater Royalty Relief Act, which incentivized, not opened up, but incentivized the Deepwater Gulf of Mexico for exploration and production. So that's really what r- turned the fire hose on, for, for lack of a better term. Um, it, it, it opened up the deep water and just created this massive influx of business to our area. And between 95 and now, we've more than doubled the size of the port because of the, the advent of deep water exploration and production. So where it has led led Port Fouchon and our customer base, which you know I have to say that we we wouldn't be anywhere without our customer base, and and those are the service companies for the oil and gas industry. The um, the oil and gas companies, you'll see their signs up, you know, the Shell, the Chevrons, the BPs, the Anadarkos. Uh, they may have sold out now, but you know, there's there's a number. All of the oil companies are kind of operating out of Port Fouchon, but they're not our direct tenants. Uh, our direct tenants are the Schwest, the Bollingers, you know, Halliburton, Schlumberger, uh, Hornbeck, Harvey Gulf, those guys, the, the service companies, okay? So so they have created this place that is the most efficient place in the world to service the offshore oil and gas industry. The expertise, the, the sheer uh, quantity of the commodities like liquid mud and cement, and pipe and all of those things necessary to service the day-to-day activity of the the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it is here. There's, there are folks that come from all over the world to see Port Fouchon because they're trying to create it somewhere else, and they just tend to not be able to do it. And I would have to say it's because they don't have the people from down the bayou actually doing the work. Okay, I mean, I, I'm proud of of our of our community. I'm proud of the people that live here. And we have the best people, we have the best expertise, um, and the know-how and the uh, get-it-done attitude uh, to make it to make it work. And we're very, we're very. Uh, I think I think a lot of people 
um, don't see it enough, don't hear it enough, um, and maybe take for granted of, of what we have here uh, in, in Port Fouchon. And it's, it's, a, it's a gem uh, in, in the community, and, and, and it's a gem in the country, quite honestly, because of, of the work that we do and the 16% of the nation's oil supply that, that we service. Um, uh, you know, as, as the oil and gas industry goes, so does our community. And, um, a, as it goes in the Gulf, um, in, in being a part of that, that oil and gas production is the energy supply for our country. So we're very proud of that. And I think, um, we need to keep saying it as loud as we possibly can. So that's a great segue, Chet, into the next thing I wanted to bring up, and that's to for you to give us a snapshot of where we are today, give us some facts and some statistics with regard to Port Fouchon and, and how it services not only the oil and gas industry, but just the entire country. Right. So, um, you know, the last seven years have been pretty interesting, and, in, you know, with the industry, um, it's, it's, seen, it's been flat for a little bit. Um, but we actually just in the last couple of months, we've seen some, some positives. We've seen some things pick up a little bit. Uh, we need to see more rigs drilling in the Gulf. Um, I think, you know, we're still at, we were at 17 last week. We went back down to 14 this week, uh, for, for Port Fouchon and for jobs and for activity. It's all about the drilling process, right? It's, it's new exploratory drilling. Obviously, um, not to get too much on a soapbox of, of, of for politics, but we, you know we're in a we're in a position where the current administration uh, in Washington it doesn't like fossil fuels. Um, but what we continue to preach, and I, we you know uh, we've had the opportunity to testify um, to different uh, committees in Washington uh, multiple times, and. Uh, anytime, anytime I present to anyone that, uh, you know, we get, we get folks from, uh, staffers from DC, congressmen come in to listen to us and, and talk about how industry and the environment work together. Um, and I, I always tell them you can't build a windmill or a solar panel without petroleum products. And we have to have a balanced approach to our energy portfolio. So as we continue to move forward, oil and gas is going to continue to be, um, necessary for our country, for our energy needs, uh, while we transition to more renewable sources of energy. But but petroleum products are still necessary. We're still going to have to produce oil because everything that we enjoy every day are based in, in petroleum. So as we move forward, we are on the, the front end. Uh, we're trying to get be ahead of the game in terms of um, wind energy, and any other type of energy, if you if it needs to happen offshore, there's no better place than South Louisiana and the Bayou region and Port Fouchon to do it. Uh, we have the expertise. It's the same expertise. It's the same people, the same companies that are servicing offshore oil and gas that are going to do offshore wind or hydroelectricity or whatever it may be. Um, it's all, it's all the same types. You know, it's vessels. It's it's logistics services it's getting getting intermodal activity you know equipment from inland to offshore you know it's it's all the same uh we have the supply chain so we can do it so we're we're in on um on a lot of those meetings uh we're we're you know talk with the governor and his and his crew on you know trying to position louisiana Uh, and then there's a number of those you know uh Representative Joe Ogeron is, is on the cutting edge of, of wind energy as well. So we're trying to position Port Fouchon to be that go-to spot for, just like it is for offshore oil and gas, for offshore wind in the Gulf of Mexico, when and if that comes. You know, we, we know that it's based on the federal government and, and what they want to do and how fast they move in terms of leasing out, you know, just like they, they lease out for oil prospects. They're going to have to lease offshore leases for wind prospects. So we're putting ourselves in a position to capitalize on any type of activity that takes place in the Gulf of Mexico. And and with that, as we move forward into the future, you know, we, we just were um, authorized by Congress in December of 2020 in the Water Re- Resource Development Act bill or the WERDA bill uh, to go from what we currently authorized at 24 foot of draft de- depth 
uh, with an advanced maintenance of 27 feet, which we're pretty much maintained to. Um, we were authorized to go to a 30-foot authorized, authorized depth with a 3-foot advanced maintenance to 33 feet. So that 6-foot difference, you know, when you're dealing with, with vessel activity and water in ports, it's all about depth. So, so that's our first phase of authorization, and we're um, very fortunate that in the House version, House of Representatives and Congress uh, version of, of a, um, a project bill or environment and a public works bill that just passed the, the full house, we were, um, through the Corps of Engineers, were awarded $1.5 million uh, to complete our environmental uh, report, our, our environmental impact statement for that deepening. Um, as well as use some of those funds for planning and design of the deepening of, of uh, so hopefully by next year, the end of next year, we're going to be getting our dredging to, to 33 feet, and we're we're going to continue to um, develop. We have plans to do um, to continue deepening. Hopefully, in two years from now, we can get uh, authorized to go to 50 feet in just Bell Pass. And we have a new development that we're calling Fushan Island that'll be um, our deep water um, facility. It'll be project cargo, windmill offloading, um, decommissioning, because a lot of these offshore structures are 30 and 40 years old. They have to be decommissioned. And we're really uh, looking to build a facility um, and attract business to a facility that's um, creating more capability for the United States to get into that market uh, and deep water rig repair, refurbishment, that sort of thing. Um, so we're, we're working towards that uh, as we speak and, um, you know, working to provide better access uh, to Port Fuchsia. I know that there's been, you know, I've, I've heard conversations uh, over the last few years about Port Fuchsia and people not in the know and just concerned about, man, what's going to happen if, if oil and gas goes under, you know, especially with the new administration. And anyone that just heard everything you just said uh, has to be optimistic about the, the direction of this port, where it's headed. And, and I think you brought up an interesting concept that I really hadn't thought about in, in a way. You know, we, we associate Port Fouchon with oil and gas, but you, the port is really a service port. And so it does make sense that it would be fairly easy to transition, uh, you know, those services to other types of energy. That's, that's correct. Uh, and, and believe me, our, our customers, the users of Port Fouchon, are interested and they're paying attention, and they're and you know I, I talk to to dock facility operators on a daily basis, and they're all like, "Look, if you get an opportunity and somebody wants to offload anything, it doesn't matter. We have the crane capacity to do it in Port right. Fuchsia. Um Look, we we're working with um, our new development in, in Slip D, which is not bulkheaded yet, but it's we're completing some dredging in there now. Um, we just did a a um, preliminary lease with a company that wants to do some test sites on growing sargasm grass. You know, the raisin grass we used to see offshore when we go trawling. And so sargasm grass, they want to do some test sites to grow it. They, they want to do some aquaculture. So um, this is going to be kind of a preliminary run for this company so that they can see uh, if they can grow it on a more massive scale and actually utilize the sargasm grass. And what they do is they, they take it, uh, they grow it, and then they take it out of the water. They squeeze the, the juices out of it, sell that to pharmaceutical companies and all of that. And then they take the pulp and they sell that to, like, uh, animal food uh, people and that sort of stuff. So there's there's a market for that. Um, and, and when it first came to us, you know, I kind of – we're like, really? We need that? You know what? Yes. Any opportunity we have to do something different to um, kind of diversify what our economy is, we have to take advantage of that uh, so that we're, we're not always worried about the ebb and flow of the oil and gas industry, where, yes, that is a huge part of who we are. And the... the um, Fishing as well, you know, shrimping, crabbing, that sort of thing. It's, it's a huge part of who we – it's always going to be in our blood, right? Uh, but we have to provide new opportunities for our, our community to grow and create 
jobs um, for the future. And that's what we take to heart at the Port Commission. That's what we're always looking to do is how can we better our community to, to be here for the long haul and be here for the long term. And um, that's our goals. And we're continuing to do that. And, and I think what, what you're going to see and what the community is going to see in the near future, and they may have started to see it in Galliano, you know, with the airport, we didn't talk anything about the airport. We, we, um, we acquired the airport from the parish in 2001 just to bring out a, about a different dimension, and that's grown uh, to, to our community and to what the, the services of the port. That's grown to have a $95 million annual impact on the state's economy. The little airport that most people don't go and see, uh, and it, we're continuing to, to, to look at that, and, and I think you know, we have a $32 million project under construction as we speak that's giving us a better access to the airport with that airport corridor project that is building a new bridge uh, to connect LA-1 and 308 uh, at Airport Road, and we'll build a connector road uh, to the four-lane highway. And that's going to have better access for safety uh, for the community uh, so that folks are not having to go down Lady of the Sea Hospital Drive, right? Um and it's a it's a it's going to be another access point for our community, as well as another, um, you know, part of the reason why the airport hasn't grown the industrial park is because of access. We're trying to create better access so we can continue to grow and build the economy. So you have that thirty two million dollar project, and then quite proud to say that we've had a hand in. Um, working with the federal government, with the state government, with DOTD, with the parish, um, and, and with the, the private sector uh, industry uh, to, to get the rest of LA-1 built. And that project, DOTD, is opening bids on October 6th. Um, and that is going to be a $450 million project. So in just those two projects, you're almost at half a billion dollars of infrastructure being built in our community. And this airport corridor project is a three-year, $32 million project. This LA-1 project is a six-year, $450 million project. And that's not port projects. You know, that's not bulkhead that we're building and, and, and different things that we're doing in the port and dredging and, um, and all of those things. And, and I, I, think, I think it's important for the community to know that we're going to, it's going to be busy down here uh, for a long time, and uh, we're very proud to be a part of that. And I think another thing that's important is, um, you know, as we're doing development in the port itself, you know, we're, we're dredging a lot of material. And right now we're creating another 200 acres of marsh to the north of the port. Uh, we're, we're trying to play our part in rebuilding our coast. And the deepening that I talked about, the, the 33 foot, as well as more importantly, the 50 foot that we're going to hopefully get approved uh, in a couple more years, is going to create millions and millions and millions of cubic yards of material uh, for years to come in a sediment starved environment where we need this. I mean, anybody that fishes in the marsh on either the Barataria side on the, or the Terrebonne estuary side, can see it, um, that the marsh is just going away. And we're going to create a recurring source of sediment in a sediment starved environment, and we can help rebuild the coast on a daily basis. So that's what we're, we're excited about, how all of that goes together, how all of that plays a part in, you know, keeping our habitat, keeping our culture, keeping our heritage in place, um, and really showing and bringing people in here to, to show them how our community, how our industry and our environment work very well together. Port Fouchon is a good place to see that. Chet, you've uh, you've touched on every other topic that I wanted <laughs> to bring up, uh, but I do want to go back to LA One for just sure. a minute. The elevated portion, as you mentioned, these projects, the mitigation efforts in the port, uh, the airport corridor that we're going to be seeing built uh, fairly soon, and of course, elevated LA One, the finishing of it. We've seen, you know, for the past ten plus years. People have been driving on that, and and it's it's been helpful not only for our community and and the port, but you know the the town of Grand Isle right. and and so many people that visit 
there. Uh, it, it's it's been such a, a blessing for the community. So I think it's interesting to bring up those those you know the environmental impacts and things of that nature that the port is is bringing to the community. But these projects that are directly impacting the community, not just from an economic standpoint, but just from a convenience standpoint for for our residents here. With that said. How can, can you kind of put in perspective how the elevated portion of LA One, how that project specifically has benefited uh, Port Fouchon? Yeah, I mean, look, the the reason why we were able to convince the federal government to give 135 million dollars to the state to com- to have the that was the last pot of money we needed to get this road built is because of the economic impact of the port and that and LA One and. You know, anytime LA-1 is overtopped with water, like we had seven times last hurricane season, um, the, the the main thing to point out is that for six of those seven times, for every other storm outside of Hurricane Zeta, we would not have had to close the port. We would not have had to evacuate the port because the port did not have water on it at all in, in the first six events. It was only Zeta that we would have had to react if we had LA-1, uh, elevated LA-1. The point is, is that, and the reason why we were able to convince them to give us 135 is because an economic uh, benefit cost analysis, economic impact report was done as part of the application that DOTD did and applied to the, the infra grant, uh, which was federal DOT dollars. They found that when LA-1 is overtopped with water, but Fushong can otherwise operate, it costs the national GDP $500 million a day. Think about that. So when we were able to put that in writing, and it wasn't, it wasn't me saying that, it wasn't Henri Boulay saying that, or any other member of the LA-1 coalition or any other member of the community. It was an, an outside you know, uh, consultant that took all the data together and put it together and, and put it on paper. And that's that's an amazing stat that's an, uh, that we can point to, and we were able to, to to get those funds. It means I, I can give you another reason why it means so much to to have this road. In 2018, uh, myself and a couple other members of, of of our staff went to New York, and we went. We, you know, we were thinking about the 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 future development and and the need to maybe bond money out, right? To get, sell some bonds, to do some more work. And we went to Moody's. That's the the group we went to. We met with them in New York. Uh, and we did our presentation and everything. And they held all their questions until we, it was, we were done. And the first question that they asked me was, people in New York, mind you, what about LA-1? When is that going to get finished? And they asked me that because they said, look, you're vulnerable. You're a risk. So if you, before you build LA-1, if you come to, to, or before you have that at least in place and we know that it's coming, um, it's going to cost, like your interest rate on the money you're going to bond out is going to be fairly high where it shouldn't be. Um, because we, you, you know, your resiliency factor is not there, and you're going to be a risk. And that's when we came back and said, okay, guys, <laughs> we need to be all in on getting anything, everything possible we can possibly tap into to get LA1 built. That's what it means to us. And, and, and I, think, I think what people um, fail to realize or, or doesn't get talked about enough is when you're looking at a $450 million project that's going to last – six years, it takes six years to build. That's a huge influx of money into the community. They need a place to live. They need to buy gas. They need to buy food. So they're, so the community is going to benefit um, uh, from from the construction phase of the, that project and then forever once it's built. Well, Chet, we really appreciate you joining us, and, and I'm, I'm sure that we can talk for hours yeah. more about all this, but I think we've hit on a lot of the the high points of the history and, and where uh, Port Fouchon came from, where it's going, and uh, we, we really appreciate you sharing it. Uh, I think you've given even me, I, I've learned something. Uh, <laughs> as much as I have, have uh, learned about the port right. over the years, I've even learned something from this conversation, so we really appreciate you uh, being on the show with us. Thank you. Uh, at the end of every show, though, Chet, we do have a round of rapid-fire questions, so we're going to have some fun with you before you leave. 
Uh, you can give us a one-word answer or expand if you feel the need to explain. <laughs> it's totally up to you. So you All ready? Right. I'm ready. All right. First, what's your go-to order at a Down the Bayou restaurant? All right. Two things. Chicken or seafood gumbo. Always have to have that as appetizer. And um, fried shrimp and fries. I mean, there's just there's nothing like uh, fresh fried shrimp. I'd agree, man. Uh, and and now you're making me hungry. Uh, so you said gumbo. So here's the second question: right. Potato salad. Does it go in the gumbo or on the side? It's always in the gumbo for me. Oh, okay, absolute man. I like it. Uh, here's a good one: jambalaya, red or brown? Man. <laughs> okay. Yes, I love jambalaya, and I love it both ways. I grew up with it being red but started later eating brown. I love them both. I would tell you I probably cook brown more than red. I, I'm the exact same way. I grew up on red jambalaya and, and now have brown more than ever. Uh, what's your favorite Cajun French word or phrase and its meaning? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I love it. So, there, man, you can go so many ways with that. I think... I think the one I use the most is couillon. <laughs> and I think Classic. we all know what couillon yes. is. Uh, you know, dumb, I guess, just to try to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what's your favorite snowball flavor? Grape. That was quick. Oh, yeah. No question. All right. So here's here's the last one. When a boat is passing. Now, this is important. This is the executive director okay. of Fusho. So we need your opinion on all this. Right. When a boat is passing and you're in the car, is the bridge open or closed? The bridge is open. Definitively. Definitively, the bridge is open. Okay. <laughs> and that answers the question. The, the bridge is okay. Let me let me let me elaborate on this. The bridge is only closed when the when the bridge is down. The things are closed, and there's a sign that says "bridge out." Then the bridge is closed. Okay. That, that <laughs> clarifies it for me. I'm not going to argue with you. All right. That'll do it for this episode of the DTV Podcast. Again, thanks to our guest, uh, Chet Chasson, Executive Director of Port Fouchon. Chet, once again, uh, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You can subscribe to the DTV Podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at the DTV Podcast. You can also follow Bless Your Heart Nonprofit on Facebook or on Twitter at BYH Nonprofit. You can donate to Bless Your Heart on Venmo at Bless Your Heart Nonprofit and on PayPal at Bless Your Heart Nonprofit at gmail.com. That'll wrap it up for us on the DTV Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button for our next episode. Until then, this is Brendan McLaren. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.